Godzilla X-Kong, or GXK, which sounds way more metal than this movie deserves, is stupid, irrefutably dumb. It leans into the Guardians of the Galaxy meta-slash-self-aware territory where it doesn't simply refuse to take itself seriously, it slips on a f***ing banana peel and screams like Goofy. <laughs> I get the knee-jerk reaction to say it's honoring the Showa era in defense of this, because as Godzilla fans, we love those movies, but that doesn't make them objectively good movies. They're absolute schlock, and there's nothing wrong with that. But to suggest the movie is bad on purpose because it's imitating bad movies, and therefore it's good, isn't a real argument that should exist in any universe. The Showa era had Godzilla using its own breath to fly. By the time this one gets to Godzilla bringing Kong to Suplex City, are we sure we're making a good movie here? <laughs> I already went through this last year with Transformers Rise of the Beasts where fans just couldn't handle the fact that movie was dog water. I used to defend the Matrix Resurrections, so I've lived in denial too, I understand. And I'm actually a defender of the last movie in the MonsterVerse, Godzilla vs Kong. But this one is not that movie, and in fact, if their first matchup was aiming for a lighter tone, this one is transparent. It's beyond silly. I'll start with the most damning thing, nothing in this movie feels like it matters. It mostly takes place in Hollow Earth, but Hollow is a more apt description of the film. It applies whether it's the nothingness of a plot or the actual characters in the movie. Especially the kaiju that weigh an untold number of tons but fly around on screen like they're light as a feather. Nothing matters and suspending disbelief is not an option at all because there's no character to connect to. The dialogue is sometimes on par with Madam Web. Listen to me give an actual proper critique to this. I, I know it's a monsterverse movie. Director Adam Wingard is a talented visual artist but instead of smashing toys together we've gone full video game with Kong basically upgrading like he's Kratos. The first movie he got an axe, this time a yellow power glove. Next movie's upgrade he'll get a shield, plus two power on counter strikes. Godzilla is, you know, godlike and possesses basically unmatched power and durability. And that's not a problem unless you don't know what to do with it. Like this movie, for example. Once again, his co-star Kong gets more of the focus and most of the screen time, while Godzilla spends almost the entire film on a fetch quest. For G fans, the debate of who wins in a fight goes in our favor. But Kong's face is all over the screen, so who really wins in the end? Characters do dumb shit and things just happen because they need to, or screen time's wasted on things that turn out to be pointless or dead devastatingly cringe. You know, it's hard to not make more Madam Web comparisons when these are the same things I laughed at that movie for. The olive branch I can offer is to say there are degrees to this. No, this movie isn't as bad as Madame Web mostly. The best way to tear into this is to go through the story, and this review's coming out on opening weekend, so spoilers. But that's the thing with this one. There's nothing to spoil about this movie. There are no surprises, and just like hanging out with P. Diddy, it turns out what you suspect happens absolutely happens. Roses are red. I dropped my team piece on the floor. Because P. Diddy be wanting the body, and you gotta tell him no. Let's get into the story, but first a quick word about this video sponsor. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of top shelf goods from under the radar brands. 90% of the products they have come from small brands, many of which are based in the US. Every month they introduce their members to cool new products based on a preference quiz you fill out. From clothes to household items, camping and cooking gear, basically pick a category and the stuff is high quality. That's the point, period. I had to be away from home when I got to pick some things to try, so I tried their travel gear. First thing was the Weekender bag by Line of Trade and it's exactly what you'd expect. Simple, durable, high quality, classic seatbelt style, nylon strap and a reinforced frame. And I also got the Canteen, which includes an insulated hedgehog lunch bag, as it's called. It's an awesome name. It comes with a silicone lunch bowl and a utensil set, which are ironic probably better quality than most of my utensils in my apartment. They now offer a new membership program where you can get really great deals all year round. I'm talking like 30% off or more sometimes and it's totally free to join. You'll get a customized selection of products picked for you and before it ships you'll get to see what's inside. Decide if you'd like to keep it, swap something out, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want and the lineup is constantly changing every month. Like I also got a knife but I don't have it because uh, my dad took it. It was just a really nice knife. He just took it. I think it was this one. It was nice. To get a free mystery gift with your first membership purchase, click the link in the description and enter TMC gift at checkout. Or go to bespokepost.com slash TMC gift. And now the story of Godzilla x Kong. The movie starts with Kong and Hollow Earth being chased by creatures that look like Man Bear Pig. He kills one of them and it scares the others off, freeing him to sit down and turn this carcass into a Scooby snack. But darn it, poor Kong has a boo-boo. 
an infected tooth. Yes, a toothache is a plot point in a major Hollywood sci-fi blockbuster. To top it off, it also has absolutely zero effect on the story and just wastes the audience time, so there's, you know, that at least. In 10 years, we've gone from the drama and darkness of the 2014 Godzilla to goofy green slime and a toothache as a plot device. For better or worse, the difference is so stark it's hard to feel like these movies inhabit the same universe anymore. Up on the surface, monarch scientist Dr. Ilya Andrews, played by Rebecca Hall rocking a traditional 1995 bowl cut, is giving a lecture where we learn they've only mapped five percent of the hollow earth at this point. She says, we only thought life could exist on the surface of the earth. Yeah, minus all documented underground life, but please go on. Lazy is a good word to describe this kind of dialogue, which is peppered throughout the film. It's dumb, but there's no excuse for it. Why does she have to say something stupid here? Just have her describe how incredible it was to discover hollow earth, not something goofy and easily disprovable with a conscious thought. I know this is a monster movie, but I don't think wanting introductory dialogue to not sound full of buffoonery is a big ask. Anyway, so Godzilla's roaming around Earth laying the smack down on anyone getting into shenanigans. He shows up in Rome to slap around Sebastian the Crab, and the thin veal disguising Adam Wingard's love for Guardians of the Galaxy collapses. With colors and over-the-top cartoon-style guts on the screen ripped straight out of the opening of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And I can't even say this is a complaint, it's just very obvious. Godzilla absolutely bodies this crab and basically robocops this guy. Like, just absolutely obliterates him. Godzilla's base level is so powerful in these movies, the chance of any monster beating him is the same as Hasbula winning a slapping competition. And right before the title card appears, Godzilla throws up in the crab's mouth until it explodes like a piss-filled water balloon. With that, the gauntlet's been thrown, and it's on for what scene will be the goofiest in the movie. At this point, I text someone and said, I'm five minutes in, and this movie's over the top as fuck. <laughs> At a Monarch post on the surface world, a sound wave is recorded coming out of Hollow Earth, and the computer screens actually flash in big bold letters, Uncharted Area Detected. Elsewhere, Gia, the deaf orphan kid from the last movie, has been adopted by Jonathan Taylor Thomas, I mean Dr. Andrews, and Gia's having hallucinations and scribbling black pyramids on paper. Turns out those black pyramids are sound waves, and the same ones Monarch received. Ha, a deaf character drawing sound waves, I see what you did there, and I don't know how to feel about it. Anyway, so Kong comes flying out of the little wormhole that's connecting both both worlds near the monarch post Dr. Andrews is at. He's in pain from the unfortunate plot device, the toothache. The tooth's entire reason for being in this movie reveals itself when dude bro veterinarian shows up. Basically, he's here to replace the Skarsgård brother who is too pricey for the sequel. If you haven't decided if you're on board or not at this point, you will be now. <laughs> yeah. He lowers himself down into Kong's mouth while a retro hit song plays like it's yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy or something, and yeets the tooth out with a fucking helicopter. Really. And the retro music for Levity Thing is getting extremely played out. It's a Hollywood trend that needs to end. Guardians did it right. It was like a superhero version of a Tarantino movie, where the music selections had a purpose and were often integrated into the story. But here it's an afterthought or a decoration. Their presence is just as hollow as the rest of the movie. To top the big yoink off, he replaces the tooth with a jet black metal one. So this guy is magically a fucking titan veterinarian that also moonlights as a dentist for 300 foot monsters. And when he's not being the bad boy rebel with a heart cliche, he spends his time flirting with bowl cut. Or like later on in the movie, he lets a random mosquito from an uncharted and previously unknown section of Earth suck his blood because he's that kind-hearted and mosquitoes deserve to eat too. He really does that. He works with animals and when a spooky-ass version of a bug he's never seen sticks its needle nose in him, his first thought is, take all you need, friend. Not only that, but he actually shames another person for questioning him. How can this guy be that fucking stupid and still be alive? And the tooth he puts in Kong's mouth amounts to absolutely nothing. He doesn't use it even though they tell us how strong it is. I guess it's just there to assure the audience Kong won't be having trouble eating man bear pig carcasses in the future. So Kong coming up here with the toothache was only to introduce this one ultimately unimportant side character. Awesome. Rebecca Hall decides they need to see what's going on down in Hollow Earth. So to prep, she 
fetches the comic relief podcast guy from the last movie. I had to look up this character's name because I couldn't remember it after two movies and multiple viewings. That's how unimportant these human characters are. And his name is Bernie for the record. Why does she need this guy's help when she has an entire team of scientists and personnel dedicating their lives to this sort of thing? Because comedy relief podcaster is a flashier one note character trait than scientist guy number four. So we have our team going down to investigate an area that's 95% uncharted with absolutely no idea what to expect in the most dangerous part of the world. A podcaster, a veterinarian, a pilot, and a scientist and her adopted deaf daughter. Right on. The podcast guy becomes the audience surrogate as he freaks out going down the wormhole. That makes sense. They didn't prep him at all. They just threw a podcast guy into one of the most dangerous situations on the planet. Please take note that once they get down inside Hollow Earth, the pilot is dispatched and eaten almost immediately and no one gives a fuck. How are you going to get back up? Who's going to pilot the ship? It, it doesn't matter. It's as if the characters know the script will figure it out for them. The movie goes on autopilot from here on out. Godzilla's occupied almost the entire movie on a fetch quest to get supercharged, running around and consuming any nuclear energy he can. He senses something's happening and is prepping for it, aka a perfect excuse to keep the most powerful character out of the picture. He's so powerful, in fact, I think no country on Earth at this point would bother messing with him. He's unstoppable and has Earth's best interest in mind, so it'd be wise to let him do whatever he's doing. But when he destroys a nuclear plant in France, they deploy drones to attack him. Why? Just don't. Is this a meta statement on how much governments waste tax money? Back down below, Kong's ultimate search for family continues. For a CGI gorilla, his story in the last film was halfway decent and was the only thing even partially developed in that movie. Well, the sound wave from earlier is the answer to his prayers, because it's revealed a subterranean hollow earth. So an earth within an earth within an earth. He meets the baby Yoda of the movie, a little Kong, who goes Chucky on him and attacks him. The two adult Kongs absolutely lose their shit and light him up too, leading to one of the dumbest things I've seen in a movie in, well, weeks I guess. He uses the baby Kong as a club and starts swinging him around and hitting things with it. It's amazing, I don't even need to break this down or make fun of it, it speaks for itself. The adult ones scurry off, leaving the kid behind, leading to Kong taking him under his wing after using him like a baseball bat. Like, hey, we square? Alright, good, you little fucker. And there's a pretty decent setup for a bear and a cub story dynamic here, but the movie ultimately decides to paint by numbers and check some basic story boxes instead. Dr. Andrews, the podcaster, adoptee, and vet find a cave covered in hieroglyphics where the sound waves came from. Conveniently skilled, Dr. Andrews deciphers that the sound waves were a distress signal sent by the Iwi tribe, who Gia was thought to be the last of. There's a much bigger and bad Badder threat boiling underneath Hollow Earth waiting to get out. The Scar King, who's a foil to Kong, and basically the same thing if you painted him orange and stretched him out in Photoshop. And upon discovering the Iwi, Dr. Andrews assumes her adopted daughter will want to stay here with her people. And just like any mature parent, skips simply asking Gia, assumes her initial instinct is correct, and proceeds accordingly. A titan named the Scar King is obsessed with launching a biblical ass whooping on the surface world for the sake of being evil, and Gia is the lone person who can summon Mothra back or something. Why is she even here? Because she can talk to Kong? He speaks sign language, so why not bring someone who isn't a disabled child on this kind of perilous mission? But why should we care when the writers don't? There's a scene where Kong and Kid Kong kill and eat food together, and that basically stands in for the relationship building portion of the story. The lowest bar for effort has been crossed. Once they reach the lost group of Kongs, shit gets absolutely out of pocket. Little dude leads Kong back to his people or whatever, and they're supposed to be digging out of the earth, but I, for the life of me, do not understand what the fuck they're doing. Their entire goal is to get to the surface world. Well, they just exit this area later, no problem at all. There's literally an exit, actually, and they just go. The bad guy goes to the surface world without any barrier whatsoever when the movie needs him to. What was he waiting for? And why was he just having his minions move rocks? Who the fuck is this guy? Anyway, before that happens, Kong and the kid meet up with one of the adult Kongs who attacked him earlier. And we're supposed to feel bad when he starts getting batted around, even though he attacked Kong unprovoked and then left his kid to die. But sure, let me shed a tear when Big Stretch comes down and just fucking ayya! Sparta kicks the guy into lava. I shit you not, that's what happens. Kong and the Scar guy battle it out and of course you have no idea what the actual limit and durability of each character is. You just have to take the script's word for it and rely on the plot armor. Like Kong can use the kid gorilla as a nightstick and he's not even concussed. After a tussle with Kong, Scar releases his legendary Pokemon and it looks to be a dual ground and ice type. I'm all for new kaiju being introduced in 
this universe, but this thing is the most unintimidating monster they could have made. I'd want to give it a hug if I saw it. It's adorable. Kong narrowly escapes with the aid of the kid and makes his way to Gia and her tribe. And wouldn't you know it, there's a giant power glove now available at a toy store near you. Not only that, but it was damn near complete before the government pulled funds. At your convenience, Moby. So Kong gets a power glove that heals his injured hand, again, at your convenience, and then goes to the surface world to get Godzilla to help him. Help him with what, you ask? Well, to fight Mankey and Lugia, of course, who are walking straight toward the surface world with no problem at all. The plots kept Godzilla busy giving the Scarface treatment to another monster and absorbing its radiation. And by the time he's gone full Super Saiyan, the movie has gone full absurdity. On a level of recent cringe in modern Hollywood, Godzilla fighting Kong in this movie is pretty next level. Just look at this image and make up your own mind. Just look at it. Godzilla attacks Kong on sight and is about to give him that Mortal Kombat Jack's big boot fatality before Mothra shows up and is like, Scream! No, stop! And Gia looks like she's straight out of Avatar The Last Airbender. The final 15 minutes of this movie is those three fighting Diddy Kong and Avalug from bouncing around in zero gravity where 300 foot monsters flail around like they're human sized creatures and destroy any sense of scale at all. And by the time they get to the surface of Earth and destroy Rio de Janeiro, Scar makes the ice monster use its powers to induce a second ice age. That's right, this villain's plan is the same as Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze. They break the monster free by stripping Lanky Kong of the vague crystal thing he was using to control it. And the monsters all unite in giving him one final Hadouken and obliterate him and the last two hours of my life. The movie might be over, but the saga certainly will continue. And it looks like it's going to continue in this absurd direction for better or worse. Clearly, in my opinion, for the worse. I also understand and appreciate that a lot of people enjoyed this movie on opening weekend. And I was looking forward to it myself. I've been a fan of the franchise since I was a kid. I own almost all 30 plus movies. I thought Godzilla Minus One was the best movie of 2023 and it deservedly won a Best Visual Effects Oscar on a $12 million budget. Godzilla x Kong's imagery and by proxy the VFX look beautiful, but they don't look believable either. I'm struggling to find the point in making a live action movie that just looks like a really wonderfully animated cartoon. The 2014 original took place mostly at night, so a common complaint was often not being able to tell what was happening on screen. But when darkness is done right, it helps hide CGI and keep things looking more realistic. It's why the T-Rex in Jurassic Park from 1993 still holds up. Now Godzilla doesn't even look as realistic as he did 10 years ago. Maybe that's the point though. It all goes together. The lighter tone, a sci-fi movie series going from plausible to goofy, a cinematic universe becoming more bombastic and stylistic. That isn't actually a criticism directly. The studio moved in that direction with Godzilla vs. Kong a few years ago and I thought the approach was warranted and worked at the time. And as far as compliments go, the fights between Godzilla and Kong in that movie are at least memorable, rewatchable, and I'd even argue now iconic imagery by Godzilla movie standards. Because at the very least, it's a kaiju movie, and that's where we can look for a positive when worse comes to worst. But nothing about this movie's battles are memorable. If they are, it's for all the wrong reasons. And with the human characters ranging from goofy-ass stereotypes to one-note plot movers, we could have done better. The lighter tone isn't the problem, it's the execution. The other thing is that I actually care about the Godzilla franchise, and so it doesn't make me happy to come back with this report. I was hoping to do a second positive Godzilla review in a row, but that's not in the cards. One part of me is happy the movie's doing well because I'm not not sick of Godzilla movies by a long shot, but I know it just reinforces the studio's bad behavior. This one is worth waiting for streaming. GG's.